everyone to the December 12, 2019 meeting of the City County Planning Board. Would you please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? first order of business today will be the consent agenda. These are items for which the petitioner is requesting withdrawal or continuance or items for which staff has recommended approval and no one has signed up to speak in opposition. For all public hearings, each side will have a total of 12 minutes. There will be no rebuttal period. Once the public hearing is closed and the board goes into work session, no one is permitted to speak unless the planning board member asks them a question. For general use district zoning requests, the planning board must consider the full range of uses allowed in the zoning district being requested. The petitioner may not refer to a specific use for the property. For special use district zoning requests, however, the petitioner must identify the intended use or uses of the site and give specific details on how the site will be developed. Items under section B of the agenda will require final action by the appropriate elected body, either the city council or county commissioners. As such, votes taken by the planning board concerning these items are recommendations that will be considered by the elected bodies during their review of the request. Before addressing the planning board today, we will need your name, address, and zip code for the record. The first item of business is the approval of the minutes of the November 14th meeting. Are there any additions or corrections? Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. All those in favor, sign. All those opposed, same sign. Thank you so much. That's unanimous. Mr. Corley, I now call on you to review the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We had some people sign up in opposition for item B1. So the consent agenda is just item C1 um, today, which is a planning board review for a cemetery in the AG zoning district. It is a really, really small piece of land, as you can see from this uh, picture on the slide on the east side of Sullivan Town Road, north of Tyner Road, out in the unincorporated county. Um, and this is just uh, uh, showing you a picture of the site plan. Um, this little circle right here is the inset here, which shows you the proposed cemetery. It's three burial plots with an access easement off of Saddlebred Lane, which is itself an easement. Um, this plan meets all requirements of the UDO. Staff recommends approval. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Corley? All right, thank you. No one has signed up. Uh, is anyone here opposed to this recommendation? <clears throat> Seeing no one, I declare the public hearing closed. Uh, discussion, or is anyone ready to make a motion? Make a motion to approve. Motion by Ms. Jarrett. Second. Say second. By Mr. Bryan. All those in favor? Oppose the same sign. And we have one to recuse himself. Mr. Grubb. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah. 
And that's all we have on the consent agenda. I'll turn it over to Gary Roberts for item B1. Okay, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, this case is zoning docket 3425, and this is a petition for rezoning uh, by the property owners, Redeemer Presbyterian Church. And the site is 1.12 acres in size, located on the west side of Miller Street, south of South Hawthorne Road, and it's also just east of Melrose. Uh, the request is a special use rezoning to rezone the property from RS9 to IPS Institutional Public. <coughs> Uh, this is Legacy's Growth Management Plan. It's located within the pink urban neighborhoods. And this is a zoning map showing the subject property there <coughs> highlighted in yellow. Uh, the diagonal street above this site there, again, is South Hawthorne Street. Um, you have the footprint of the main church area here in Sanctuary. This is a former <coughs> public school uh, located on the west side of Miller Street. Uh, that is zoned institutional public. Um, right here is a property. This is a single family home that was rezoned as part of the church expansion in 2013. Uh, and that included one access point right here on the Miller Street and some parking in the back. So this is adjacent to that. Uh, the property zoned, as I said, RS9, single family residential, as is are the homes to the north and to the east across Miller Street. The property is also located in the um, Ardmore National Historic District. And just a clarification on that, that uh, National Historic District's compliance with the standards are voluntary. It's not like a local historic district. So as far as demolition of properties, which they're not proposing any demolition, but demolition of homes and accessory buildings within National District can occur at any time. Uh, but they are showing to retain these, these th three structures. Uh, this is an aerial photograph showing the subject property and the devel development pattern. Uh, and these images are taken on site. This is looking at the existing church there from Miller Street. Uh, you see right here to the right, uh, this is the existing driveway. It will be widened slightly. It will remain a one-way access point that will eventually connect on to their parking lot that fronts on Melrose Street. Uh, and that's a little bit of a close-up there of that driveway. Uh, this tree, as shown on the 2013 plan and the current plan, would remain in place. Uh, this is the house here on the right that is zoned um, institutional now. That's also a contributing structure within the National Historic District. Um, and so these two homes here are the subject property that they're adding into the district for IPS. That's 1040 and 1036 uh, South Miller Street. <coughs> Uh, and this is looking um, north on Miller Street as well. Yes, the subject properties to the left have Hawthorne in the back, back avenue there. So we were out on sign check. We, we did notice there's some traffic out there, uh, certainly at certain times of the day. Um, but actually, they're not adding capacity to the church, but they are adding some capacity in regard to parking uh, and primarily circulation. We feel like that this request may actually improve some circulation between Miller and Melrose. Um, so this is looking across <clears throat> Miller Street at the single-family homes. And over on Melrose Street, this is looking into the site. Uh, so this is already zoned IP. The church there is to the right. Uh, you can see a little bit of uh, the barn. That's actually a contributing structure within the district. That's to remain right about in this area here is where the new parking will take place and connect in with the existing parking lot. So over in here is the actual subject property. This is a directional rezoning sign. Um, this is the area plan, Southwest uh, Winston-Salem area plan. Uh, you can see the different land uses shown in color designations. Yellow would be single family residential. Uh, green would be recreational. And uh, blue is institutional. So we have a mixture of uh, blue and green for the main campus and the subject property is shown for yellow. Uh, just a general note about institutional land uses in regard to our area plans. It's very hard to show in each area where a church or school may or may not expand. Generally, area plans uh, mention that institutional expansion is something that's okay if it's done in a manner that's compatible with the specific site surroundings. 
And this is a site plan, a little bit different orientation from the zoning map. So you have Miller Street down here on the south, uh, the existing church here, uh, existing driveway that you saw pictures of earlier, and the proposed nine parking spaces lo here, located here kind of shaded uh, shaded there in light gray, and then, then the one-way connection that goes over to the parking lot that fronts on Melrose Street. Um, so the existing institutional house here, IPS, and then this is a subject property here of these two homes. Uh, they would have to dedicate some additional right-of-way on Miller Street. Uh, they're showing no real expansion of a parking area behind these two homes. And then you have the third lot here that actually goes all the way over to uh, Hawthorne Street. And you see this dark line here, that's the proposed zoning line. Uh, this is also owned by the church, but that's not within the rezoning request. That would remain zoned single family residential, uh, the home that fronts on Hawthorne. Uh, so then you have open area here, and again, about nine spaces that kind of straddle this proposed, <clears throat> proposed zoning line. So. Uh, looking at the site plan and considering the area plan recommendations and the character of the neighborhood, uh, staff feels like it's a reasonable expansion of this institutional use. Uh, no new institutional driveways on either street and actually some connectivity that may improve circulation uh, in the area. Uh, some special conditions we have, uh, number one, if the petitioner sells the remainder of that pen that I won't go mention that number but that's 925 South Hawthorne that fronts on Hawthorne Road uh, that if that is ever um, sold that any remaining property excuse me that the buffer yard would then be in installed at that point uh, because they own that property all the way through there uh, they did not feel like there was a need to have a buffer yard staff was concurrence with that and uh, so but if they did ever sell that they would have to install the, the buffer yard plantings the evergreens in particular also, they've agreed to no electronic message board signs. Those are allowed in the IP district. Uh, we did not feel that would be consistent with the residential character there of this setting. Uh, and they've also agreed to a condition that is not uh, in your book, uh, and that's um, the zoning designation for the properties identified, and those are those two properties that I mentioned on Miller Street, um, shall revert back to RS9 if those properties are ever sold. Um, there was a condition on the other adjacent IPS that uh, if um, that property was ever sold, the parking lot in the back area there would be removed. Uh, so this is similar but a little bit different. This basically just states that the zoning would go back to residential if the church ever sells those properties. Uh, again, summary, uh, it would maintain the pedestrian-friendly character along Miller Street by keeping those two homes. Uh, one of those is a contributing structure. Uh, with their, within the Ardmore National District. It would facilitate improved vehicular circulation between Miller and Melrose Street, and it would provide for an appropriate transition between residential and non-residential uses. So staff's recommendation is for approval, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, should those properties burn down uh, or become deteriorated to the point where they need to be replaced what would be what would happen then well we have uh, the footprint of the structures now shown on the site plan and if that un un unforeseen act was to happen I think we would be looking for a structure that would go back that was very very similar in character to what you see there now and is that required in in the conditions in any way would the petition be held to that? We don't have that specified. I guess that's a that there's a slight chance that that could happen, but it, it could happen. Um, I, I think we the petitioner would probably be willing to add such a condition if we could agree to that wording. I think the site plan does a, a, a good deal of tying them to that because the site plan does label those structures existing house to remain. So if those structures, those two homes did burn down for some reason and somebody wanted to a new structure back on the site we would be looking for a house as gary on said that book. fits that that okay. so the site plan is what's tying those structures and any new structures mm -hmm. to what's on here all right that's satisfactory okay no, you, may I? Yes. yes um in the event the church were to sell to another church would you still require the reversion of the zoning back to rs9 the way the, the wording is, if the property sells, it's, it's regardless of who actually would buy the property. And the rationalization being? 
I guess there's a comfort level, per, per, perhaps presumed with the current property owner and um, with a new petition or new, a new property owner, maybe that, that comfort level would not be there. So it's just a level of protection that they have volunteered and staff is agreeable to that. Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Any other questions for staff? All right, thank you. So it looks like no one has signed up to speak in favor, so we do have opposition in this case. M Mr. Chairman, you may want to just open it up and see if there's anybody here that came in late that does want to speak in support of the case. Okay, two. All right. So I'm going to declare the public hearing open. Each side will have a total of 12 minutes. So if you could approach the podium, please, and we would need your name and your address and zip code. So who's going to speak first? Good morning, or good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Rob Alexander. I'm an elder at Redeemer Presbyterian Church, and I live at 2253 Westover Drive, just two blocks from the church uh, in the Arbor neighborhood. And uh, you know, I have Your seen. Zip code, I'm sorry. What's that? Zip code. Two seven one zero three. Thank you. Yeah, and I live um, as a member of the neighborhood. I live in this area, and I actually used to work for the church as well up until this past year. This uh, parking lot, actually, and you saw earlier with the traffic on Miller Street, it's, it's sometimes of the day almost impossible to get out of that parking lot. And we have a number of elderly um, folks in our congregation. Our congregation is getting older all the time. We also have a number of handicapped folks. Uh, and getting in and out of that parking lot, um, northbound especially, um, is very dangerous. It's dangerous for not only the folks in our church that actually use that lot, but also for guests. We actually have um, almost every night of the week guests that are using the church free of charge as members of the neighborhood and other nonprofits in the neighborhood. And a number of years ago, probably about 20 years ago, there was somebody killed in front of the church getting in and out of their car. So pulling uh, parking off the street and moving it into the parking lots as much as possible is very important to us from a safety and security standpoint. The other thing I would say, too, is the church is committed to maintaining the residential nature uh, and look and feel of the neighborhood, and that's one of the reasons why that we have agreed to the restrictions. It's, we don't have any intent of tearing down those houses or having them look anything different than the residential character that they're in now. We're using them um, for residences and also offices, which are allowed under the residential um, use policy, but we feel like the total IS allows us to use this green space in back of the church with an appropriate buffer yard that would be required to be a good neighbor to our neighbors next to the church. So that is the intent uh, in the filing. And also, um, you know, we want to be a good neighbor. We've uh, attempted to work with the Arbor Neighborhood Association. I personally have worked through three generations of the Arbor Neighborhood Association trying to move this project along. And so that brings us to the point we are today. So that's really all I have to say in, in favor of the project at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Question? Yep. Yeah. Good afternoon. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it was curious about these two houses being included sure. in the IP because yeah. that didn't seem to block your flow of traffic or the parking lot or anything like that. So explain to me a little bit more about what the need is to include those in so as the, IP. There's um, actually uh, two reasons uh, at this point in time. So first of all, if they weren't included, our buffer yard could have essentially been in the back of those properties. And essentially that green space that we want to use back there, and which we are using now, would have a large landscape buffer yard right through the middle of it. And that's not our intent. Our intent is to actually use all that green space together. The second is we're also we're potentially bumping up against a uh, impervious service uh, impervious service surface requirement and we wanted to have all that property actually contribute to the impervious surface requirement and so that would be the other reason for it does that make sense yeah it does i can get some clarification from the staff about the buffer yeah, yeah. Okay. okay any other questions any other questions all right thank you yep i think we had one other gentleman who wanted to speak my name is Paul Fedish, and I'm with uh, MLA Design Group. We're the landscape architects on this project. And I'm up here uh, for two reasons. One, to 
hopefully answer any other questions that you gentlemen and ladies have and also just kind of reiterate uh, what Mr. Alexander has said. Uh, going through Excuse the me, need your address and zip code for the Oh, record. I'm sorry, the address one. is 6514 Doorknock Drive, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27410. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was mentioning uh, Mr. Alexander and the church have been very good to work with on this project. They are very agreeable to working with the neighborhood. From what I've seen, we don't have a whole lot of clients that work to this extent with the neighborhood. Uh, they are very in favor of keeping the character of the neighborhood, keeping the houses that are there. They understand that they are restricted to any further building on this property. They will keep what is shown on the site plan with the understanding that if there are any revisions in the future, they'd have to come through this entire process again, of course. Um, They've also volunteered several of the conditions that you see on the plans. Uh, the buffer yard requirement between the uh, residential property that's remaining residential and the one that's being rezoned that they own, they're volunteering to put in a part of that buffer now. Uh, they'll go ahead and install the trees yeah, with the understanding, of course, that they would have to complete that buffer yard. Uh, the church was agreeable to working with the adjacent neighbor on the type of plants that'll be going in between that person's property and the church's property. I know that they are agreeable to work with the neighbors on any drainage uh, discussions that come up as this goes through con the construction documents. And I, I do know that they want to keep the, retain the character of the church. So I'd be glad to answer any questions that you guys have. I know that they would like to have a consistent use on these properties. And as he mentioned, uh, we are looking at how much impervious surface is on the properties, and I know that if we got to a point where we were going to be required to have stormwater quality or quantity controls, that we could remove driveway or remove some impervious surface someplace else to kind of compensate for that. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer those. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Around eight minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Roger Henderson. I'm at uh, 2680 Amesbury Road, Winston-Salem, 27103. Thank you. Uh, I'm a deacon at the church and also work there as a finance officer. I don't have anything to add from what uh, <coughs> was just been said, <coughs> other than to reiterate that uh, just the church and its mission is to be a good neighbor and a servant to all. Uh, none of these changes that we have seen have been conceived with any other fashion other than to make it better, uh, better and easier for the people that use the church. It doesn't particularly add any capacity to its service, but it does add to its ability to serve just via parking and convenient parking, uh, getting more parking off the street. Uh, as uh, Mr. Miller just said, uh, there's a really good chance that two driveways on existing structures would be eliminated. Uh, and to do that, not only to add more green space, but to further uh, move the traffic through the Miller Street ex entrance. It was misstated a little earlier. That is now, that is not now a one-way driveway on Miller Street. It's two ways. It's narrow, but it's two ways. We're contemplating making that one way off of Miller Street through the lot and then any exit from that through the Melrose Street connection. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak in favor? All right, we have two uh, who've signed up as opposition, Mr. Robert Newman and Mr. Darren Rhodes. So, Mr. Newman. Hello, my name is Robert Newman. I live at 1341 Berwick Road, Winston-Salem, 27103. And I am the elected president this year for the Ardmore Neighborhood Association. And I'm standing here today in opposition to the plan proposed by Redeemer Presbyterian Church. Ardmore is unable to grow, and we are entirely landlocked and can only shrink in stature. It is one of the main goals and purposes of the ANA to fight for every inch of Ardmore to keep all aspects of its remaining zoned area residential. 
Redeemer's growth may be a blessing to them, but not to us. We can't afford to allow any entity to impede on our neighborhood and change its structure from anything different in residential zoning. Redeemer has been a wonderful neighbor and uh, in the past, and we have appreciated working with them in the past. And I believe they will continue to be one regardless of this outcome. However, friends or foes, we cannot support any type of zoning change. Additionally, I don't believe any type of DOT study has been done. This area, as you can see from your pictures, is already failing with traffic issues in the eyes of the neighbors and those trying to get to work just every morning. This additional cut through seems as if it would add to the chaos with people trying to take advantage of the new connection and trying to beat the light at Hawthorne. The ANA does not believe the proposed plan meets the needs of the neighborhood and we stand in opposition. However, we do have a question for the planning board. If this were to go through, regardless of opposition, could the church be allowed to not change the RS9 status of the homes and simply move the vegetation barrier between the properties they own and the ones that they don't for the screening requirements? It was brought to our attention at the November 20th meeting that this was one of the critical factors, as was stated earlier, in requesting the zoning changes for those homes. To allow the staff and congregation the ability to move back and forth on campus without marching through shrubbery, as well as taking people away from a very busy Miller Street. Or would the planning board approve the request conditional on the houses remaining as residential uses, striking all of the institutional public uses, which the church maintains it has no plans uh, to use these homes for anyway. So that is it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Any questions for Mr. Newman? So I, uh, thank you. Um, so I think I'm understanding what you're saying because it related to my previous question of why were these two homes in there? Correct. Yes, sir. So the two homes on you, Miller Street. What you're suggesting as an alternative is that the um, we're the buffer could go yes, by the garage in that area. Is that if, if you're looking at the picture um, right there, that home that is more or less a sideways L, we're asking that the buffer zone be put um, right actually where it currently is stated and just leave those two homes RS9. Would the planning board allow them not to have a buffer zone between the property that is already, you know, it's institutional zoning and the two homes that they already own as RS9? Because they already own the properties anyway right, right. and they don't, you know, have any intention of changing said property. So. <laughs> okay, I think that, I think I understand what you're saying. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Rhodes. Hello, I'm Darren Rhodes. I live at uh, 1031 Miller Street, uh, zip code 27103, and that is adjacent or across the street from uh, the two residential structures in question. Uh, I've lived there for 20 years, and uh, while I by no means represent uh, the neighborhood, um, I, I would like to say as a, as a property owner that the church has been a, uh, a good neighbor during that time, and I feel that uh, their um, request is, uh, in most, for most respects, compatible uh, with uh, the neighborhood. Um, I do have some concerns, though, and those have been kind of echoed by the Neighborhood Association uh, related to the necessity of the institutional rezoning. Um, my main concern, though, is making sure that uh, as much as possible the residential structures uh, maintain their residential character. I understand that they're going to be used institutionally, but uh, for instance, the uh, driveways, if at all possible, I'd like to have the driveways retained because if those are removed uh, for uh, impervious surface um, requirements, um, it could change the character of the, uh, the residential properties. Um, also, uh, it was mentioned by the, uh, by the applicant uh, that the drive would be one way. Um, I believe it's shown on the, uh, on the site plan as being a one-way drive. Um, I'm not sure if that would be required, but uh, that would be also, you know, something that would be a concern to make sure that it, it doesn't become a two-way drive. Um, also, the uh, drive uh, not being used for, there's also a school there, making sure that the drive's not be not to be used for uh, drop-off for the school because that would cause, likely cause uh, traffic backup on an already busy street. Um, 
I believe those are my main concerns. Um, before I signed up to speak, um, I, real, I found that you had to sign up either in opposition or in support. I'm not, I'm not adamantly <laughs> opposed. Um, I'm not, I'm not a huge supporter either. I'd like for it to be like it was when I moved in there 20 years ago, but things change. <laughs> For the most part, the park-like setting behind the houses is really nice. Uh, if that can be retained and that's on the site plan as being retained in terms of the green space, the trees, I think that's a good thing for the neighborhood you know, because green space is a premium in, in Ardmore. Um, and uh, then the last thing, just to reiterate, making sure that the, uh, the houses are as much as possible retain their residential feel. And uh, you'd mentioned, uh, I think, uh, Ms. Donegan, uh, that you know, a scenario of, of what if one of the uh, houses or both of the houses are um, you know, destroyed by fire or some other type of natural dis disaster. Uh, my concern would be what if they're intentionally you know, torn down? And is that something that's allowed? And uh, evidently that's been addressed by the planning board is uh, that's something that the site plan would uh, ensure against. So uh, my concerns are addressed in that respect. Thank you. Mr. Rhodes could ask the question. Um, I'm confused about the drop off for the school because when we were over there for the site visit, I think we saw the drop off from the school from the Melrose side already. And I thought that was at a pretty appropriate to get the kids dropped off, not on the, those right. two main roads and in that, but is that what you meant? You didn't want it to be used for a drop? No, no, no. My what I meant was that would not change. If, if okay, the, if so that the, would be used to, for the drop off for the kids. And right, the, the current one way flow. Right, right. Okay. Any other questions? Thank, you. thank you. Still six minutes. Okay. No. Well, we have six minutes left for our opposition first. Okay. We generally haven't done rebuttals at the right. past we for, don't really don't for the planning the board, beginning. but <coughs> perhaps if there's a question from a board member, or, I don't yes. know. Does anyone want to have a question? If not, no. Anyone have a question? Um, actually, I did have a question. Right. I didn't know if I should put give it to staff or to the petitioner, but. Um, the uses that are being requested under the IPS zoning um, do not appear to be uses that di that would not be allowed in RS9 already. So um, you're not planning on requesting any additional uses. Okay. Could I ask the staff a couple of questions about this? Mm -hmm. to, or is this, or do we wait may, to vote? No, you may want to close the public. Well, is, is there anyone else that has questions yeah, for yeah. anyone in the audience? Yeah. All right, so I'll declare the public hearing closed, and now we can go into our session. Yeah. Okay. Um, there were a couple of things that came up in their discussion that, that, that um, is it reasonable to move the buffer? I mean, where would the buffer be? Could you show us on the, on the uh, screen where the buffer would be if, if it did move? So uh, right here is the, uh, the proposed zoning line. So yeah. you see the buffer would go in this area here. There's some alternative compliance language here where you have some of the existing driveway and it narrows down. It's a 15 foot type two buffer mm -hmm. yard. And it goes to this point here. Right. Uh, and this is the open area that they mentioned that they use and would really not like to have a lot of evergreen shrubbery <coughs> to prohibit um, right. pedestrian circulation. So they have agreed to the uh, deciduous tree plantings in here, and we have a condition that if this property ever sells, that they would then install the rest of the buffer yard. And then it picks up in this area here, where again it abuts RS9 and breaks down towards this area. Okay, so based on that and, and what the staff is saying, they don't require a buffer on the Hawthorne house, then theoretically, if these houses weren't included in the IP, you wouldn't have to have a buffer on the, uh, I don't know what it is, that the uh, west side of that? Well, well, if these, uh, you mean if these two houses right. are not included, well, then you have. That would be the buffer a, would be the houses. Well, there would need to be a buffer yard along here. Why? They there isn't one on permits. Hawthorne, though, on the Hawthorne property. They, they would have to have a buffer yard through here somewhere. What? If but they, you're saying they don't have to have a buffer yard on the Hawthorne property now? 
Uh, we have agreed to a condition that they do. Okay, the so there could be a condition where you don't have to have it. Well, that, right. That, if you're going to condition this prior to us looking at it, right? It, it's because that property is in the same ownership. You may remember we did a text amendment for Buffer Yard several right. years ago that gave us some flexibility, and you don't have to buffer against property that you that's in that the same ownership. Own. So, right. so that's why we have the flexibility in that case where they said we don't want to buffer ourselves. The ordinance allows for that to for that option to be on the table. Um, and so it would be with the other property they own as well, right? It could theoretically be, yes. The the, the one thing that that we need to keep in mind here, there, there's sort of two issues, um, as I've kind of heard the discussion. One is sort of the issue of the rezoning. The, the new asphalt that's going in on that, that property that's today or RS9, where that new park, those new parking spaces are, y you have to rezone that. If you're going to put that park in, you either have to rezone it or get a special use permit from the city council. Those are the two options. So that area, mm -hmm. in order to do this, would have to be rezoned. The, the other thing I would just mention to you is, and this will to some degree seem a little bit counterintuitive, but by putting those properties under a special use site plan and holding to what's on the site plan, you're actually giving more control to the neighborhood by pinning them down to a very specific. What they're saying. Whereas if they were left out and they were RS9, those houses, they could, we could issue a demo permit if one was applied for tomorrow, whereas under this plan, we could not. Right. Mm -hmm. So I know that seems a little counterintuitive, but the, okay. the, the site plan actually provides some greater restrictions mm -hmm. and, and greater protections to the neighborhood. Just okay. something to think about as you guys deliberate. My other line of questioning is I feel like over the years I've become quite an expert in what institutional uh, zoning means to a neighborhood. And if the staff could help me on some of the things, um, does this mean that dumpsters could be behind these houses? Well, w without one being shown on the site plan, the answer would be no. Would we be do no. Have, we do have one centrally located dumpster. Okay. Um, um, what about additional lighting and and things like that that come along with institutional? It would be subject to the lot. This parking lot would be subject to the lighting requirements of the UDA. The parking lot, but what about the two properties that are going institutional? Those are what I more care about than the parking lot. I mean, because there is a buffer for I like the buffer for the parking lot, but I'm trying to think of the other things that come along with institutional are different uses, different times of the day, lighting, uh, HVAC units, um, uh, dumpsters, um, uh, you know what? I, familiar with lockdowns or lock-ins when kids come over and things like that it, it changes things in other words i'm trying to get a sense of what that would do for the neighborhood in there but any any sense of what we would be held to or in terms of it went institutional you, you know like chris said those two properties would still be held to the lighting ordinance you know and you, you know that allows sure. up to 37 foot tall poles and cut off fixtures and half half foot candle you but know, there's nothing shown on the but, plan. But there's nothing shown on the plan that you would theoretically put those, you know, you put those poles in when you're doing parking lot lighting. And so it, it would be, uh, the, the pole wouldn't have to be shown on an S plan, would it? We generally don't get to that detail right. of showing lighting poles, right. but, it, but I guess what Chris and I are saying is there's nothing shown on this plan that would be allowed that would probably necessitate the need to put in that. You know, you may have some, I can see the need perhaps for some six-foot-tall pedestrian scale kind of lighting like you would typically mm -hmm. have around a home. I could see that but i i don't see anything here that would make me believe there would be a need to put in 30 foot tall poles you know traditional commercial lighting back there and lighting is expensive and, and you know you, if if the petitioner wants to volunteer that's something they can volunteer okay. there i mean it's yeah i'm just trying to see how tight it is in terms of what the changes would be okay Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I'd like discussion? to make a couple of comments. All right. Um, I really don't. I, I I can see the need for the driveway, the drive-through, <laughs> and the use of the property containing the barn um, to be rezoned to IP so that that road can be put through to improve the circulation. Um, I don't see a good, valid justification for rezoning the two properties on Miller Street. The reason being um, that they have, have no intention of changing the uses that they already are using those properties for. 
which are allowed in residential. So the neighborhood, I think, is justifiably concerned about a creep of institutional that would happen beyond what's already proposed here, kind of like a domino effect. Um, and I can see that happening, especially since the um, Hawthorne property, the Gobble House, um, is being split in its zoning under this proposal. And I think it makes that house much less viable as a residential property for that reason, <coughs> uh, because it is going to have a very, very short um, back setback. There won't be much room and, and for the back setback if that's the boundary line where the IP zoning is. Um, and my big concern really is the impact this could have on the homes fronting on Hawthorne. Should um, this get agreed to, there is greater justification for rezoning that gobble property to IP. Um, and then that splits that whole block. And um, I just see it as a threat, really, as a long-term threat to the viability of, of single family on that stretch of Hawthorne, that block. Um, I also think that it would be easier, much easier for the petitioners. Right now they, they're saying they want this land behind the two Miller homes as a buffer, in a sense, more green space. But it could just as easily be used as a parking area. And all they would need is a um, site plan amendment if they got the zoning here. And then they could put in a parking a larger parking area here. So I just see, I mean, I, I certainly would not object to rezoning the, the lot by the barn so that they can do the road, but I just don't see the justification for the additional rezonings beyond what uh, Mr. King has stated about the protection from demolition. That would be the only, only, protect, the only positive that I see. So I just really can't support this. Aaron, could you address that, just the, her part about the two houses being part of this and just staff's thought, thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think as staff reviewed this, I think the reason we were supportive a lot is, of, of, is a lot of what Gary mentioned. You know, we want to make sure that, that institutions are being um, sensitive to the neighborhoods they're in. And by protecting those homes, we saw that as a valuable piece of this request um, to put a, a, a regulatory – um, instrument in place that guarantees or that prohibits those houses from being torn down. Um, we saw that as a good thing to preserve the character of the neighborhood. Um, you, you know, speaking, Melinda, to kind of what you were saying about those houses either being in or being out, it, it, so there's sort of two options. If, if, if this request does go forward and if it is approved by city council and, and some years down the road they want to put parking in there, you're correct, they would have to come back and file a site plan amendment. If we leave them out, we're really kind of at the same boat because at that point it's, it's either you've got RS9 property that you want to put parking in and we're really at the same crossroads at that point. It's either special use permit from city council or rezoning. So, I mean, we're kind of at the same crossroads in or out. So um, those were the things that staff kind of thought through, keeping the houses, not having electronic message board signs, and really trying to be sensitive to the surrounding areas. Those are the reasons that staff was able to support this request. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Is there a motion for further discussion? Mr. Chairman, with regard to case W3425, I move that the planning board find that the request is consistent with a comprehensive plan. Second. It's been motioned by Mr. Grubbs and seconded by Mr. Stillman. 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 Okay. All those in favor? All those opposed? Passes five to two. Mr. Chairman, got a further motion if that's okay. Yes. I move that the planning board recommend approval of case W3425. I forgot about that. It's been, is there a second on that? Second. Second by Mr. Seegers. All those in favor? Good. Sorry, really quickly, just wanted to remind the board that there is a change to the conditions that were proposed yeah. with this request. So you would need to make a motion that the planning board recommend approval, including that new condition. 
Can we hit the rewind button? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Let me uh, let me back up and and say that uh, I move that the planning board find that the petitioner's request with the additional condition added that the zoning designation for the properties identified by pins 6825-30-6400 being 1036 Miller Street and 6825-30-5497 being 1030 Miller Street shall revert to RS9 if those properties are sold at any time by the petitioner uh, is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Previous motion on the floor with additions by Mr. Grubbs. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Stillman. All those in favor? Opposes? Still passes. All right. Thank you. And, Mr. Chairman, I also move that the planning board recommend approval with the added special condition, which I read into the record previously, mm -hmm. uh, of case W3425. Thank you, Mr. Grubbs. Is there a second? Second. It's Mr. Stillman. All those in favor? Sign of aye. Pose the same sign. Passes four to two. Five to. Johnny left. Johnny left. Yeah, but we still have seven. It, it would have been five in support and two right. in opposition. Yeah. And His vote should still count as a. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Thank you staff report all right thank you mr chair um you should have at your places a copy of our 2020 calendar of significant dates and i just want to spend a couple minutes on this really to recognize the work that desmond has done on this um we have basically had the same rezoning submittal process in place for about the past 20 years that nothing has really changed from the time an applicant submits an application until the time they get before the planning board for the public hearing what has changed in the past 20 years is the amount of information we review, collect, analyze, distribute. It has increased greatly. If you were to pull a zoning docket from 2000 and one from today, they would look drastically different. So as you can imagine, from a staff standpoint, we've got the same amount of time to do our work in and a substantial amount more of work. So um, the other real challenge with this process is we oftentimes write these staff reports in, in the dark. And what I mean by that is we have an interdepartmental review process where an applicant um, would come and get comments and then there's a they have basically a week turnaround to submit those comments we essentially to get these books out in time to you have to basically write our staff report before those revised plans come back in in anticipation of what may be on there a very challenging task and so um, I started kind of hinting around to Paul when I was in Desmond's position that we might want to think about sort of changing this a little bit. And so Desmond quickly learned to be in this position. He came to me and said, hey, can we think about doing something else with this? And so I said, yeah, let's let's give it a shot. And so Desmond has put together um, this new calendar that we have before you. And essentially, the long and short of it is it adds about a week to the, the, the review process. And what that week does is it allows us to kind of separate out and add a little bit more breathing room in there to get this work done. It allows us to get the revised site plans back in and then complete the staff report, which is incredibly helpful. Um, this is kind of like a Rubik's Cube. You know, you move one thing and something else shifts because we have to be respectful to the applicants to make sure we're not crunching them. We've got staff. We don't want to crunch them. We work with other departments. We don't want to crunch them. And so you move one thing, you hurt these folks. And so... Desmond did a really great job of um, getting this calendar put together. We're going to try it out this year. I think it's going to be successful. It doesn't really have any impact on, on sort of the neighborhood side of things because the, a lot of the dates that are important to neighborhoods really don't move in there. Um, the real impact on this is for the development community that, that submits and goes through this process. And so we did vet this with them and get some feedback, and they were, they were supportive of the changes, even the additional week that we've got in there. And I think the reason for that is we were by far the fastest process to go through. And even with this week, we're still right there in the discussion. So um, it doesn't take us out of character with our triad uh, peer communities as far as the time frame to get through. But it does give staff a little more breathing room in there. And I think it actually gives the development community a little bit more breathing room in terms of getting through this process. Because I think even they were starting to feel the pinch 
of getting things through so quickly. So <laughs> I just wanted to let you know we have a new calendar moving forward for 2020. That is a big accomplishment for our department. I just want to thank Desmond for his hard work on this because it was uh, many iterations to get to this point. So um, I, I hit uh, Smith Reynolds earlier. Just wanted to say we had our second meeting. Um, Haynes Hosiery, probably about 50 folks there. Good discussion there. Um, we kind of focused on economic development and appearance and design issues. So um, some good comments there. Next meeting will be January 16th. So we're continuing to move forward on that. Um, I'll recognize Desmond for a little preview of our January public hearing meeting, which I hear will be kind of busy. Yes, um, just to kind of go back to the calendar of significant dates, one of the things that changed about the calendar does have an impact on this board. Um, instead of having one kind of event that's called sign check where we go with the board and visit the sites and make sure that the signs have been posted, we now have a little more room in the process to separate, you know, going out to visit the sites and answering questions from the board about the sites and actually checking to make sure that our, you know, legal obligations are met for posting signs. So we've got a um, site visits line, which is when staff will go out with the board to visit the sites and answer, and staff will answer questions from the board about the sites. And then sign check is just a staff only thing where we'll go out to make sure that the signs are posted. Um, site visits are, with this new calendar, are always gonna be the Monday after this meeting, the Monday after the public hearing meeting. And so um, if you've been scheduling sign check in the past on your calendars, this is the new thing to look for um, as far as going out and, and visiting the sites. And again, it's always going to be the Monday after this meeting, unless there's a holiday. Jack, did he say so, a larger van? In there? Did larger van, that? more donuts. Um, <laughs> most importantly, I think more time for for a board air oriented questioning and thought as compared to um, to looking for signs, which I greatly appreciate. Thank you all for that. Yeah. More donuts. And this calendar is very helpful. Yes. Thank you. It's very helpful. All right. So with that out of the way, we have five zoning requests for January. Um, people, people were not phased by the new calendar. Um, we've got five zoning requests for the city and the county, one in Walkertown, and then there's one preliminary subdivision approval for next month. So six items for this board in January. And to piggyback on that, your January work session will be pretty busy as well. So um, get ready for a busy 2020 starting off that way. We got a lot of stuff to bring to you, including um, a little discussion at your work session about the transition to iPads. Thank so you. we'll be having myself and hopefully Tom Koreska, who's our IS director, um, present kind of our, our plan for um, implementation at your January work session. So we're moving along on that. We hope to have some good news to bring to you there. Um, <coughs> That's all I've got other than to say thanks and happy holidays to everybody. And if I could back up half a second, I'd like the board to know that there's a large group of people that get together quarterly. That's called the Quarterly Development Forum. I was amazed at the level of favorable response that came in from them to the change in this schedule. Um, it's like herding butterflies, and they all seem to be together on this. Thank you again for that. That's good. Thank you. Or is there anything that's good for the order? If not, we'll have a motion to adjourn and everyone have a nice holiday. Thank Wonderful you. holiday. Here, Thank here. You. Uh, no, no, no.